And everybody should feel responsible. I mean, not everybody does, but you really should feel responsible to have a calculator in class, do the calculations. Believe me, doing it in class helps you. Helps you stay awake. Helps you know what very number makes sense to you or doesn't make sense to you. Yes, Tim? 0.78. Point what? 78. 0.78. Yeah. Okay, maybe my 0.78. Thank you. 0.78. And where is 78? Well, 78 is well, it's around here. But here's one. Where, and if you plug in 3.5 into the exact same theme of by symmetry, it should be minus 78. So minus 78 is over here. And basically, oops, sorry. If it's in between, if it's here, if it's past 78 or below, mi below minus 78, that will be the reject region. And if it's in the middle, that's still the exact region, because we're just carrying over this picture to this picture. We're not, doing, we're not really making any changes. We're just do, dealing, changing into numbers that are easy to, to deal with. So this label, this could also be do not reject a zero, if you can read this, do not reject a <coughs> zero. And this piece here is to be reject a zero region and a reject a zero region. So the only question is, how often would you end up with an x bar bigger than 5.5? That's the same as how often you get a z score bigger than 0.78, or conversely, how, how often you get an x bar lower than 3.5? Well, that's how, how often you get an x bar lower than minus 78, which is this piece here. Well, again, if you look at it, it's got to be a pretty big percentage. But if you go to the back of the z table, which anybody who has a z table can look up, or if you have one of those calculators, type in z or whatever. What is the area? How much area is to the left of minus 0.78? Yeah, you're looking, you're looking, yeah, uh, Marcus, you're looking on the negative side of the table because you want to get, so to be honest, easy. You could do the positive, but it's easier to do the negative. So look up minus 0.7, go across the column 8, and what do you see there? You gotta be, again, it gotta be a pretty big chunk, like 20, 30 percent. Yes, Michael? It's 0.2177. So 0.22. Okay, so this area here is roughly 2177. This area here is also 2177, which I'm gonna round to 22 and 22. <coughs> so after all is said and done, this is pretty close. Of course, the right answer is 42%, which is why I was surprised, Sarah, when you got this low number, because the real answer is really 42%. So this, you made either a Kathy mistake or just bad luck, because it is random, right? You see my, my, my critique? Okay. So the, the final answer is 42%. So while maybe Gina was happy with a 38% error rate, maybe she won't be happy with a 42% error rate. Nobody should be happy with an error rate of 42%. We like to drive it down. So you can get it down to 40, 30, to 20, to 10, to 5, to 1, to a tenth, to a 0 .0001. You can get it down as small as we like by simply moving these boundaries further and further apart, which in fact, that's the next part of the spinner sign, which you're not going to do in class. This you're supposed to do by trial and error. You just take another pair of numbers, maybe try 2.5 and 6.5, repeat this calculation again, basically making these three pictures, if you like to do it really detailed and practice with chapter seven at the same time. And you try to get it down. The question, of course, is at what point do we want to stop? We're going to stop at 30%, 20, 10, 5. And we're not getting your, your input because everybody knows the answer from stack one. And it makes some sense, but it's not a magical number. Like, like pi is a, is a natural number. E is a natural number. This is just an, a, a man-made convention. That they use five, like, we're willing to make a mistake 5% of the time. So you try to try, you pick a pair of numbers and another pair of numbers and another pair of numbers. When you do this for the spinner sign, when you hand it in, I want to see these calculations done at least three times. You pick an initial guess, you pick a middle guess, and eventually everybody's going to know the right answer. But eventually, then you pick it, after two or three shots, you're going to get to your final guess and demonstrate that by doing this iteratively, you're going to come up with a pretty good pair of numbers, um, but it won't be 3.5 and 5.5. Yes, Michael? So my like main question is like what is like the general percentage you're looking for? Five percent, I'm saying that's the one. That's what I wrote down. Five percent is the number that most examples and use an alpha of five percent. Use a significance level. Use a significance level of five percent. Sometimes you'll see ten percent. Some of the spinner assignment tell you to do twenty percent. Sometimes you do one percent in real life. But five percent is like almost always five percent. That's the percentage error, right? That's me. One out of twenty. You're willing to make a mistake one out of twenty times, which is not so terrible. Means if, you know, if you have 20 tables in front of you and they're all good, you're going to say for one of them, that's a bad table. Now, you'll be wrong, but it's only one out of 20. You'll be right 19 out of 20 times. In fact, that's the next thing. On the, to finish up the whole theory of the chapter, and after we get to this, we're going to get into more practical examples. Why 5%? Why not stop at 1% or half a percent? 
the question we have to discuss right now to finish up the theory of the chapter, why do we stop at 5%? Why can't we make the boundaries further and further and further and further apart till we get it down to 0% or a tenth of 1% if you don't want to map it happen with 0? Yes? Because eventually it becomes pointless if you have it too big. Because like eventually you make it so generous that no matter how bad the table is, you're going to still say, I accept the table, I accept the table, I accept the table. You're not going to have any sensitivity to distinguish between a good table and a bad table, so what's going to happen? This, well, here we've been focusing on the type 1 error, which if you want to say it in English means we're concerned about saying a table which is really good, we're saying it's a bad table. We don't want to say a good table is really bad. But likewise, we don't want to say a bad table is really good. Anybody remember what that's called? That's a type 2 error. Two of these, but. Uh, so we have so we have to concern ourselves not just with the type one error, which is someplace I can't even read this myself. Too, really. Type one error. We also have to concern ourselves with the type two error, and a type two error is the flip side of a type one error. I say it in English. The type one error is if you say the table's bad when it's really good, but a type two error you say the table's good when it's really bad. So so. And say, if you reject the H1, when the H1 is true, what does that mean? You say it's, you say it's good, you say the random number is good, when it's really the, 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 the table, the average is not 4.5. It's not 4.5, it's a messed up table. So if you make your alpha too small, which means in effect making the boundary very, very generous, you're going to mess up your type 2 error. So which is the best, the best balance? Well, historically, you try to keep, you, you don't want to make the, the alpha more than 5% of the time. That's, that's sort of fixed. You can't, no, that's not too much control over that. So let's say you do that, and you do that, and it turns out you're type 2 error. And by the way, the probability, because we really care about how often these things, because you know it's going to happen on occasion. So the question really is, what's the probability of these things happening? We call that beta, the second Greek letter. So we don't want to make the beta too, sorry, tell me about this. Yeah. Okay, give me one second. So, um, some of you want to add something to the lecture. <laughs> um, so we don't want to make the beta too big either. But but so how did so, so after all is said and done, you know, when the alpha goes, if you make the alpha too small, what's going to happen? If you make your type one error very very small, it's making not a five percent, maybe two percent or one percent or half a percent, which means you're making those boundaries really really generous towards the biasing it towards the eight zero. What's going to happen to the beta? It's going to go up. So if you want to think about it, the book has a, a, a uh, uh, the alpha goes down, the beta goes up. So the book has a, a, by the way, one of the things you have available to you are a bunch of PowerPoint slides for every chapter. I put that on one as well. And if you go through the slides, you really have the, the essence of the chapter, you know, it might be an easier way of reading the textbook. So when the alpha goes down, the beta goes up. Now, obviously the best of both worlds would be to have alpha small and beta small. Alpha should be small and beta should be small. How can that happen? If you make alpha small, beta starts going up. How can you get them both down? And you guys know that. Yes? By picking 5%. No, no. You want alpha to be really, really small, like 3%, 2%, 1%. But every time you make alpha small, the beta starts going up. So how can you get them both down? Like maybe alpha 1% and beta 1%. Yes? Uh, maybe a larger sample. Make your sample larger. Think about it. Make proven mathematics. If you go through all the mathematics, make the n bigger, you'll see that happening. But intuitive, make out the sample size larger, what happens? Everything gets more accurate. What does accurate mean? Less error. Less error, less type 1 error, less type 2 error. So a large sample size solves. So again, a real life statistician, one of his or her jobs when they start a new project is to figure out the optimal sample size so that you balance the alpha and beta according to ways that you're willing to deliver. So this is for you and the guy behind you. OK. Roger and Alex. Yes? Uh, we added these two right here, the point twenty one seven seven to get 42. Yeah. We added both of them, right? Oh, yeah, 21 so it's not just uh, one 21 side. 2177 is, this is, this is, you should write that down for posterity. Uh, 21, 2177 plus, because you know, you can make the mistake on the high side or the lowest. So you add them together yeah. equals to 42. And again, okay, those folks, those are the kind of questions they want you to ask me to specify and to clarify things. Okay, so what do we, that's, that's now. So now the question is, to solve one of these problems the way I just showed 